Good morning. Good morning. It's always good to be together with you all, but I'm especially excited this morning because today is the first sermon in our new series uh, entitled Citizens, a study in Paul's letter to the Philippians. God's word is living and active and powerful, and I'm excited to see how God will use this in our lives over the next couple of months. With that, would you pray with me? Almighty, eternal, and merciful God, our Heavenly Father, whose word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, would you open and illuminate our minds that we may purely and perfectly understand your word this morning and that our lives may be conformed to what we have rightly understood so that in in nothing we may be displeasing unto your majesty. We pray this to you, our Father, in the power of of the Holy Spirit, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, with that, let's get down to business. We are going to be starting in Philippians, so go ahead and turn there. The first thing I want to do this morning before we get into the actual text of our passage is to set the scene a little bit for the book of Philippians. Give the story behind what's going on here. And this is important because I think oftentimes when we read the Bible or we read the New Testament and we come to some of these uh, letters or epistles, as some people call them, we forget that they are letters. Sometimes we approach it just as we would a book. And it's, it's not a book. It is a book in the Bible, but, but originally it was a letter. And so when coming to a letter, it's important to understand um, some of the context that's surrounding the situation. Why was it sent? Who sent it? To whom did they send it? This is going to be important as we study our way through and seek to understand what God has for us here. So first, let's talk about Philippi. Now, Philippi was a city in Paul's day. It was located in what today is Greece. There's a little map here I have on the next slide. Um, You can see the little turquoise dot. That's Philippi. It's in modern-day Greece. That yellow part is modern-day Turkey. And so there it was. But it's not a Greek city. Philippi was actually a Roman colony and a leading city of the region. So Philippi was populated by many Roman army veterans uh, who had been given the land there uh, by the emperor. Now, this is important, and we could see it even in some of the archaeology, because what scholars know now is that although Philippi was in Greece and there was Greeks that lived there, Latin was the official language of the city. And the entire city itself was modeled and built, and the architecture was modeled on the architecture of Rome. It was kind of a a mini Rome in a sense. And that's actually going to become quite important to us as we study uh, the book of Philippians because Paul is going to play on some of these themes. And the city was basically divided into two two classes, Roman citizens and non-citizens. So just like today, we have citizenship and the same thing back then. Rome, the, the, the empire of Rome had citizens and non-citizens. Roman citizens enjoyed many privileges that non-citizens didn't. You may, you may remember the Apostle Paul at a point in Acts plays on his Roman citizenship and gets, it, gets helped, it helps him a lot. Um, and so that's going to be important. There's a divide between the rich and the poor as there is in every city. But most of all, what we've come to know about Philippi through archaeology and things like that is that Philippi was a city that was obsessed with honor. The citizens were obsessed with honor. And listen to the way one scholar describes this. He says, archeological finds from the site, Philippi, reveal a socially stratified population obsessed with status markers, such as Roman citizenship, public office, and prestigious titles. Persons of every class competed with their peers for these coveted titles and offices, which the victors then displayed in resume form on inscriptions erected throughout the colony. So this is a society obsessed with honor and obsessed with fancy titles. Not only that, but they were obsessed with letting everyone else know about how much they had achieved. They would build statues and sculptures in the city, in the town square, just to display what they have done and the titles they had acquired. So you would be walking through the city and see a statue, and on the base of the statue, it would have someone's kind of resume, all the titles and all the things they had done in their life because it gained, they gained honor. It's kind of like Twitter or the Instagram of the first century, right? We, we tend to do the same thing now. Look at all this cool place I went, you know, even if it's fake. Look how much I've accomplished, right? They even had a name for this, this idea. It was called the Cursus Honororum 
in, in translated, that means the race of honors. It was a race to gather as much honor for yourself as you could. Everyone was constantly trying to one-up each other, trying to gain more honor and prestige than the next person. Now, that's going to be important because Paul is going to address this, and it will come out as we study Philippians. The people of Philippi were also very religious. If you were walking through Philippi in the first century, you would see thrones and temples to many gods and goddesses, Apollo, Artemis, Dionysus, Zeus, even Isis and Serapis, and even the emperor Caesar himself had his own temple. This is the context that the Christians in Philippi are living in. This is the culture in which they are trying to figure out what it means to live as Christians in a culture that has opposite values from the values of Christ. And this is a situation that Paul is addressing in Philippi. What does it look like to live as authentic followers of Christ in such a culture? What also becomes quite obvious upon reading Philippians, that Paul had a special relationship with the Philippians. It's easily his most enduring letter. He speaks most sweetly in this letter, especially if you compare Philippians to something like Galatians. It's a world apart. And partially this is because Paul himself had planted the church about a year or so prior to the writing of this letter. The story is found in Acts 16. We don't have time to read it, but I would encourage you to go back and read it. Uh, it's found in Acts 16, 11 through 40. And Luke records that Paul and his team, a lot of stuff happens, but Paul and his team were thrown into prison in Philippi. And God miraculously rescued them by opening all the gates. And not only that, but you might remember that the jailer becomes saved. He gets saved himself and his whole family becomes saved. So in Philippi then, as Paul is writing to this church, these are the people he's writing to. The people that would have heard this letter read aloud to them were the jailer and his family and Lydia and not, not our Lydia, a different Lydia. And, uh, and, and the, maybe even the demonic, the, the girl who is demonically oppressed that Paul freed from that. Maybe she was in the crowd. She was a part of the church. It's not a faceless mass. These are people that Paul lived with, that served. And this church exists because Paul went there. A small band of believers whom Paul knew by name and whom he cared for dearly. It's to these brothers and sisters that Paul writes. And there's one more thing we need to know before we begin. Where is Paul? What's his situation? That's going to be important. And we'll learn a little bit more about that next week because I'll talk about it. But Paul is imprisoned, most likely in Rome, awaiting his trial before Caesar. Now, prison for Paul probably isn't like what you might think of prison. It's not like he's in a dungeon type prison. Paul was most likely allowed to rent an apartment at his own cost and be under house arrest. Remember, he hasn't been convicted yet. He's awaiting trial. Now, he had a full-time Roman guard that was stationed with him, but he could have visitors and send letters and things like that. And he was most likely stuck in this situation for about two years awaiting his trial before Caesar. And here is what we know. The Philippian church heard about Paul's imprisonment, and they couldn't just stand idly by like all the other churches did, Paul says. The Philippian church got money together and probably some other supplies and things like that, and they sent one of their members, Epaphroditus, to carry this gift to Paul in Rome. Now, the, the, the distance between Philippi and Rome is about 1,200 miles. Now, in the ancient world, that's, that's not a short journey. That's about the same distance from, from here to Dallas, Texas. And if you've ever driven to Texas, it's a long journey. The journey back then, depending on if you went on foot or a horse or sea, could take anywhere from six weeks to three months. Just, just one way, just to get there. And not only that, but it's not like it was safe to travel back then. I mean, Paul and his journeys had gotten shipwrecked three times and gotten robbed and things like that. And this man was willing to take his own life in his hands just to get Paul these provisions. And we know that he almost didn't make it. At some point, Epaphroditus became very ill and almost died, but eventually he made it to Paul. And without, doubt, without a doubt, Epaphroditus updated Paul on what was going on in the church in Philippi. And so this letter to the Philippians is Paul's response. Now, he gives this letter to Epaphroditus, and Epaphroditus carries it back. And we'll, you, he mentions that in the book, so we'll see. But can you imagine what it would have felt like that day that Epaphroditus came back to the church in Philippi after being gone? I mean, who knows, maybe a year or more. I mean, you wouldn't really have any way to know if he's even still alive at that point. Did he make it? Did he, did he die? But he finally comes back. Can you imagine the excitement that he's carrying a letter from the Apostle Paul to this church? 
the man whom they so dearly loved. They finally get to know what happened to Paul, how he's doing, what's going on in Rome. What would the Apostle Paul have to say to this small band of believers hunkered down in Philippi, trying to figure out how the church is supposed to work? Well, this is exactly what we're going to explore over the next several weeks, and we're going to see how this ancient letter is every bit as relevant to us as it was to the Philippians back then. Because the main themes that Paul addresses and writes about in Philippians are things that we face today. In Philippians, Paul calls the Philippian church to live humbly and joyfully as citizens of God's kingdom in a manner worthy of their high calling, even in the face of internal and external pressures and threats. This was the call to them, and it's the call to us today. And this is why Paul wrote. This is the context and the circumstances surrounding the letter that we're going to be looking at. This is the context and circumstances which the Holy Spirit inspired. And these are the words that the Holy Spirit inspired. And so we read them. And so with that, let's read our passage for this morning. Now this morning, we're just going to be digging into the first two verses. The first two verses of chapter 1. So please turn there, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. We'll read these two verses and then we'll break them down. So here's what it says, Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you may be thinking, really, we're just going to do the greeting? I mean... Let's get into the good stuff, right? There's there's, just a greeting. What can there possibly be to learn from a greeting? Well, I hope after this morning I can change your mind because not only it would be enough if these we knew and we know that these are the God-breathed, inspired words of the Holy Spirit, but even apart from that, we know that Paul is incredibly, incredibly careful with what words he chooses and how he phrases Everything. Paul packs theology and encouragement into every word that he writes. And we'll see that this morning. Even his greetings to his letters are filled with wonderful truths inspired by the Holy Spirit for us to learn. And what we find here in these little two verses will apply to every single one of us, whether we're six or 60 or single or married or excited with your Bible open or your board and your Instagrams open, okay? I see you. Don't think I don't know. Uh, God's word pierces the hearts of all of us and God's word speaks to all of us. So let's break it down. The first thing we're going to see here in verse one is is about Christian identity. We're going to see a couple things about Christian identity here that are incredibly important. And the first thing is this. The Christian is a slave. The Christian is a slave. If you are here this morning and you have faith in Jesus Christ, and I pray that you do, you are a slave. If you have been saved by Jesus, you are enslaved to Jesus. You have been bought and are owned by Jesus Christ himself. You are a slave. Now, where am I getting this? Well, take a look at verse 1. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Now, most translations use the word servants because the word slave brings up all sorts of baggage that it didn't have back then. Now, it had baggage back then, and we'll talk about that later in Philippians. Um, but I'm, I'm here to tell you the Greek word doulos, if you're interested in that, is not, it's not the word that's used for a hired servant. It, it's not the word that's used for someone who gets paid. It's literally the word for a slave. And you don't have to take my word for it. John MacArthur wrote a whole book on it. So go get that if you want to find out more. But it's important because Paul begins his letter this way. He could have, called, he could have said anything. He could have said Paul, an apostle of God, which he does in most of his letters. But here... He says, Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. They are slaves of the king, servants of the king. And every Christian is. Think about it this way. If Paul, the apostle, is a slave, then you and I, who are not anywhere near apostles, are definitely slaves of Christ Jesus. You are a slave, a bondservant of Christ, a servant of the living God. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that in your life, your decisions Your actions, your thoughts, all of them must be oriented to serve your master, Christ Jesus. It means that the aim of your life is to please your master, Christ Jesus. It means that you obey your master, Jesus, no matter the cost. It means that 
as you come to every decision in your life, from the small to the big, the constant question that guides your thinking is, what would be most pleasing to Christ? What would best serve the cause of Christ? What would bring Christ the most glory? Christian, you are a slave. The entire aim of your life must now be to please Christ. And this is beautiful because the person who truly understands the grace of God and the salvation that was won for us wants to please Christ. It doesn't mean that it's not a struggle. Otherwise, we would be perfect and we would never sin. But it does mean that the person who has been saved by Jesus wants to serve Jesus, wants to please Jesus in all that they do. From the smallest decision to the largest, from should I tell this white lie to what career should I choose, to how should I raise my kids, to to how should I date, who should I date, to who should I marry, how should I treat my spouse. All these questions and every question of life must be looked at through the lens of what would be most pleasing to my master, my Lord, Christ Jesus. What would best serve the cause, the mission of my Lord, Christ Jesus? Because if you've been saved by Jesus, you know the power of the grace of God. You love Jesus and you want others to know as well. If you love Jesus, then you want to please Jesus. Jesus himself said, he said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. The Christian is a slave of Christ. This idea, this notion of the Christian's life, of of your life being entirely aimed at pleasing Jesus is summed up by the Apostle Paul later in Philippians when he says this, this famous phrase, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's it summed up in one phrase, to live is Christ. Paul says, my life, my, if I live, it is Christ. My life is Christ. That's it. That is the mark of a slave. Paul says, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about what I want to do. No, my life to live is Christ. My life is his. And Christian, this is part of your identity as a Christ follower. You no longer live life for yourself, but for Christ. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.15. Listen to what he says. Speaking of Jesus, he says, he died for all that those who live, listen to what he says, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Christ died that those who live, in other words, those who have faith, those who are, who are made alive by him, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Do you see that? It's part of your identity as a Christian. And Jesus talked about this as well. In Luke 16, 13, he said, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. In other words, Jesus is saying, everyone has a master. You either serve Jesus or you serve something else. You can't have some of Jesus. He's either your Lord, he's either your master, or he's not. You are either a slave of Christ alongside Paul and every other believer, or you're not a Christian. Remember what Jesus said. He said, and we we read this in our communion. He said, do you want to follow me? Here's what it costs. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. That's that's Jesus' church growth seminar 101. He's turning people away, his whole ministry. Do you want to follow me? Take up your cross, which, I mean, it's in our our modern day, it's like take up your, uh, your, the thing that will execute you. Take up your electric chair and follow me, in other words. The cross is an instrument of execution. You want to follow me, he says, you must die. Deny yourself and follow me. That is the call of Christ. And being enslaved to Christ Jesus, the Lord of all creation, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, is the best place you could be. He is the fulfillment of all that we were created to be as humans. Now, maybe some of you are unconvinced or, or maybe you're sitting here thinking, <laughs> dumb Christians, I'm not a Christian, so I'm not a slave. I'm in charge of my own life, right? But scripture says differently. You see, because the truth is everyone, every human, every person on the planet Earth is a slave, either a slave of Christ or a slave of sin. This is the secret that the Christian knows 
And this is the secret that makes Christians love Jesus. Look at how the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans 6, 15 through 18. He says this, What then? Are we to sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Paul says, don't you know that before Christ saved you, you were enslaved to sin and Christ set you free. And now you're a slave of righteousness, of goodness. So that's, that's it. Slaves of sin or slaves of righteousness. Slaves of sin or slaves of Christ. You either serve sin with your life or you serve Christ. And if you're enslaved to sin, only Christ can set you free. Only those whom the Son sets free are free indeed. And that is the truth. You are either enslaved to sin, death, and destruction, or you're enslaved to the gracious God of the universe whose name is love. So would you stand in awe of this truth with me this morning? Let it, let it transform your heart and your mind. Let it transform the way that you live. Let it transform the way that you think. Let it transform the way that you look at all that you do. Maybe there's something in your life right now that you know is not pleasing to God. I don't know what it is. Maybe, maybe it's a decision you've made. Maybe it's something hidden on your computer. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's, maybe it's something you haven't done that you know you should do. Whatever it might be, brothers and sisters, remember this. Jesus is your Lord. He's your master. Obey him this morning. Look to your good and gracious master and leave sin behind. He bought you with his blood. He loves you, so serve him with your life. Stamp this upon your heart. Claim the title as Paul claims it proudly. Slave of Christ. Servant of Christ. Say with the apostle Paul, to live is Christ. Let that be the cry of your heart. Let that be the cry of this church we are all under the authority of our good master, Jesus Christ. We are all slaves of Christ. The confession of the Christians from the very beginning of the church was this, Jesus is Lord. Why? Because the Christian is a slave. But you see, that's only one part of our identity. The Christian is not only a slave, no, the second aspect of the Christian's identity that we see here in our text this morning is this. Number two, the Christian is a saint. The Christian is a saint. In other words, the church is a communion of saints. The church, the people of Christ, is a gathering of saints. So OVBC, Orange Villa Bible Church, is a fellowship of saints. This is what we are. If you're a true Christian here this morning, you are also a saint. Look at the second half of verse 1 in Philippians 1. It says this, To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. To all the saints. Now, side note before I continue on. Overseers, elders, that, that term is used interchangeably in Scripture, and deacons are the only two offices in the Bible. And let me just say this. I've been to a lot of churches over the years. Be thankful that you are in a church that holds these two offices and seeks to fulfill them biblically. Honestly, that's pretty rare these days. So, so don't take that for granted. Um, it, it's amazing. So just be thankful of that. And, and as to why Paul singles out the, overseer, the overseers and deacons, there's, there's a reason that we'll see in, an, in a different sermon later on down the road. But he says this, Paul and Timothy, the self-identified slaves of Jesus, write to the saints in Jesus at Philippi. Did you know Paul uses this word, saint, to identify believers almost as much, if not more, than any other term? You won't find the word Christian much in Scripture. It's there. You won't find the word believer much. But the word saint, you'll find a lot. If you, go, if you have time, go back and look at all the greeting sections of the letters that Paul writes. Almost all of them, he says, to the saints in such and such city. This is how Paul thought of believers. This is how Paul thought of Christians. He thought of them as slaves and he thought of them as saints. Well, what does this mean? Well, for one, 
it means that saint is not some class of super Christians, as the Roman Catholic Church would have you believe. No, according to scripture, saint is interchangeable with the word Christian. It's the same thing, a disciple, Christ follower, a Christian, a brother, a sister, whatever you want to say, saint means the same thing. It's a believer. These words are all interchangeable. They do not represent separate classes of Christians. All Christians are equal at the foot of the cross. There is no class of super Christians called saints. According to scripture, if you are a Christian, you are a saint. And this is important because, again, this is a fundamental part of our identity. And if we don't understand our identity as believers, we're going to be doing all sorts of things and wreaking havoc in the world and on our own lives. So what's behind this term? What does it mean? Well, literally, saint, the, the Greek word behind the word saint means holy one. It's a word, this, this Greek word has the same root. It's the same word as the words that we find for holy, for holiness, for sanctification. Same, same word. A legitimate of this translation, a, a, legitimate, a legitimate translation of this passage could be to all of the holy ones in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Every true Christian is a saint. Every Christian can rightly be called holy. But wait, you say, I'm not holy, right? I still sin. I, I don't feel holy, that's for sure. I still struggle with sin. But here's the point. It's not about you. It's not about you. This is about what Christ has done, not what you can do. This title, saint, points to everything that Christ has achieved on your behalf, not how much you can achieve on your own. We are called holy because of what Jesus has done, what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. You are holy if you are a Christian here today. Like I said, it's the same root word as the word that, that's translated sanctify or sanctification. So listen to this. Christian, you have been sanctified. Now, here's the tension we find in Scripture. You have been sanctified, and yet you are being sanctified. You have been made holy. You are holy. Paul says, to the holy ones, and yet you are being made holy. You have been set apart by God, and yet you are continuously being set apart each and every day. That is what this title means. God has set us apart as his people, a people of his very own, of his own possession his own treasure to dwell with him forever. And he accomplished this through the death, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. So, Christian, are you holy? Yes. Do you still need to pursue holiness? Yes. Why? Because Christ has set you apart as holy and has called you to himself. We see this, this, this tension all over the place in scripture. We like to call it the tension of the already and the not yet. In other words, Jesus has already accomplished everything that is needed for salvation, but it has not yet been finally fulfilled. So we still have a life to live. We still pursue Christ. Believers have already been sanctified, set apart for God, but they have not yet come into perfection in eternity. And you can sense this tension in a lot of texts, but especially one like Romans 6. Now in Romans 3 through 5, Paul has just finished explaining salvation, that it's by faith alone. It's not by any works that we do. It's by faith alone in Jesus Christ that we are saved. Salvation, justification, simply comes by believing in Jesus. And in Romans 6, 1, then he turns to answer the obvious question. Well, okay, this is how our sinful minds work. If salvation has nothing to do with my works, then hey, I'll just believe in Jesus and sin it up. You know what I'm saying? The more I sin, the more God can be gracious. This is perfect. Right? And so Paul answers this question. He poses the question in Romans 6.1. He says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? So like I said, why not continue sinning? God can be more gracious. This is great. Well, watch how he answers this question. Now, what do you think his answer might be? If you don't remember what he says, you might think he would say, Well, no, you shouldn't continue sinning. That, that would dishonor God. You might think he would say, no, don't continue sinning. That will make God mad. You might think he, he would say, no, don't continue sinning. You're breaking the law. You might think he would say, no, you shouldn't do it. It's wrong. No, you will go to hell if you continue sinning. But that's not what he says. And his answer here is instructive. Now, those things may or may not be true, but listen to what his, the Apostle Paul's inspired answer is to this question. In verse 2 of Romans chapter 6, he says this, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin 
that grace may abound. He says this, by no means, never, God forbid. How can we who died to sin still live in it? In other words, we can't live to sin. You've died to sin. You're dead. The old you is dead. You can't, you won't continue in sin. You can't. You've been set free from it. You're not enslaved to sin anymore. The power of sin has been broken. Jesus has saved you. He finishes this out, his thought. He goes through some other stuff. He finishes his thought in, in verse 22 of chapter 6. He says, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, there's that term again, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, he says, you've been set free you have become a slave of God and the fruit that you will get from that leads to sanctification and eternal life. So why should we stop sinning? Paul says, you're dead. You, you've been dead to sin. How can we live in that? This is the power to fight sin. You are dead to it because of Jesus. You are a saint. You have been pulled out of slavery to sin and been set on a sure path that leads to eternal life. And all of this is a free gift based on nothing that you could accomplish. You see, holiness is not something that Christians, some Christians pursue and some don't. Holiness at the very, is at the very root of our identity as Christians. The God who is holy, 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 who sent his only son Jesus, the Holy One of God, to purchase our holiness with his blood. And when he ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit into the hearts of all who believe in his name is a guarantee that one day this will all be finished. God's grace has set you apart as holy. And God's grace is the continuing fuel that will fuel your pursuit of holiness. Christian, you are holy and you are becoming holy. God has made you holy and you are pursuing holiness by the grace of God. You are a saint. This is the good news of the gospel. But we're not just saints. Look, look at the verse. Look at verse, the, the second half of verse 1. We are saints in Christ Jesus. Our holiness is in Jesus. Paul says to the saints in Christ Jesus. All of the blessings of God that come to us as believers come to us in Jesus Christ. This is one of the Apostle Paul's favorite phrases in Christ. And throughout the New Testament, he lumps so many things in this. But it, but it all comes together in a long list of things that we receive in Christ. It is in Christ Jesus that God calls us to salvation. It is in Christ that God grants us faith and repentance. It is in Christ that we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It is in Christ that we've been made alive. It's in Christ that we have peace with God. It's in Christ our sins have been forgiven. It's in Christ that we have fellowship with God. It's in Christ that we become partakers of the divine nature, Peter says. It's in Christ that we have received the love of God. It's in Christ that we have received mercy. It's in Christ that we are secure. It's in Christ that we have received adoption as sons and daughters. It's in Christ that we will be resurrected because in Christ we have eternal life. And because we are in Christ, brothers and sisters, we will dwell with Christ for all eternity. So if you are here and your faith is in Jesus this morning, all of these blessings are yours in Christ. Why? Because you are a saint. You have been set apart. You have been called holy by God. Now, how should this affect your life? Well, this is, this is the fuel this is the bread and butter. This is the gospel. This is what fuels your life as a Christian. This is what will fuel your joy and what will fuel your fight against sin. This is what will fuel you to spread the gospel to the nations. Have you ever wondered why, why some Christians are so joyful? Why they are so willing to give up anything and everything for Christ? It's because of this. Because they know they are His. They know that in Christ they have received everything they could ever want or need. They know that in Christ, they are saints. The in Christ status of believers, of us, issues forth in the of Christ status. In other words, because we are saints, 
we are slaves willingly. There are no slaves who are not saints and there are no true saints who are not slaves. Those who have Jesus as Savior also have him as Lord. And what a blessing it is to serve Jesus. He is worthy of all of our lives. He is worthy of everything that we have. We are not even worthy to be his slaves. And yet, in the midst of our sin, he bought us and redeemed us, dying in our place, setting us apart to be made holy. And now, together as one body, we serve him because he is worthy. Yes, this is what you need to know today from this passage. You are a slave of Christ and a saint in Christ. Which brings us to our third and final point this morning as we wrap up. Third, the Christian is a spectator. The Christian is a spectator. In other words, we see it's all of grace. God has done it all. All of this, all of the blessings that we receive from God in Christ are all of grace. We deserve none of them. We don't deserve Christ. We don't deserve salvation. We were enemies of God, Romans tells us. And yet, because of what Jesus has done, Paul can greet the Philippians with this. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We have become God's holy people purely by his grace. We remain, we remain God's holy people by his grace. And as God's holy people, we continue to receive his grace and his peace. And that is life-changing. That is life changing because this grace is amazing. God is the source of all of it. God has called you, God has saved you, and God will provide you for you. God will preserve you. But notice this also. Because we are in Christ, God is now our Father. We can say our Father when we speak of God. The intimate and perfect relationship that Christ has with the Father is now ours. We are not only slaves, not only saints, but sons and daughters. We have been adopted into the family of God. We are not just people who are not going to hell. But you can call the God of the universe, the God of all creation, your Father. Indeed, He calls us to call Him that. When the disciples asked Jesus, how should we pray? He said, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven. God is our Father. And maybe you're here today and, and you're not a believer. You're not a Christian. You, you don't know Jesus as either Lord or Savior. Well, I'm here to tell you today that the Bible says that you are enslaved to sin and death. But Jesus will set you free. So I would urge you this morning, turn to him in faith. Don't wait another minute. Turn to him and believe. Cast yourself upon the mercy of God. He lived, died, and rose again that all those who trust in him could have eternal life. Eternal life is yours. Forgiveness is yours. In Christ, status is yours if you would follow and trust Jesus today. And so believer, Christian, know this today from the Apostle Paul himself. You are a slave. You are a saint you're a spectator to all of this, and you are also a son and a daughter of God if your faith is in Christ. So let us then spend the rest of our lives, all of our energy, becoming what we already are in Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you inspired it so that we can look at a greeting to a letter and be blessed by seeing the gospel even there. Father, we stand amazed at your grace. We stand amazed that while none of us in this room deserve salvation, that all of us deserve judgment, you have opened the way to eternal life through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. You've called us to believe, Father. Lord, we thank you for that. Father, I pray for anyone here who may be struggling in that. Lord, would you just bless them this morning? Would you encourage them? Would you remind them of your love this morning? Father, I pray for anyone here this morning who does not know you. Father, I pray that you would reveal this to them. Lord, open their eyes to see that they are enslaved to sin and death. And Lord, set them free in Christ Jesus. That they may be free indeed and become a son or daughter of the King. Father, do your work this morning. We thank you 
for all that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Walking in Faith. We encourage you to share this with others. If you have any questions or comments, please visit us online or email us at info at orangevilla.org. Till next time, may God bless you in everything you do.